All right, class, first off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. Today, we are going to be talking about the uh, the Ghost Army and about the atomic bomb, like how, how it happened, things like that. Um, here's the bad thing with this lesson. Um, so apparently what happened is, uh, what I usually do is I teach this lesson, the Monday, Wednesday class, and then Tuesday, Thursday class, and then I record this, these lectures. Um, but what happened is when I, after I taught the lessons in class, this file became corrupted somehow, and there's a couple slides that were completely erased and deleted. So when it comes to those questions, I'm just going to tell you the answers, okay? So when we get to that part, it's basically going to stop. It's going to look like the video is ending, but it's not, Okay, I'm just I'm going to be giving you straight up the answers. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the warm up. All right, so here it is. The first question asks you to analyze the picture and tell me what's going on. All right, so there's actually quite a bit of stuff going on here. All right, so look at the image left to right, up and down, for the foreground, background. All right. And the second one says, based off your analysis, what do you think this? What do you think the soldiers are trying to do? Do you think they're trying to protect something, or like set up like an, an ambush or an attack? Okay. And why do you believe this? So again, look around what's a, you know what's around the soldiers, what they're doing, and use your analytical skills and come up with a conclusion of whether they're protecting something. Or are they setting up some type of trap? Okay, so pause the video, write your response. All right, so the Ghost Army, they have they were a special group that was created and made up of 1,100 American artists, designers, sound engineers, things like that. These guys were basically like in the theater. You know, they'd be the guys who were painting the backgrounds, who were setting up the uh, the sound in theaters and concerts and things like that, you know. Um, these guys were artists, and their job was to basically deceive the Nazis. Now, their official group name is, there's two of them, the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops and the three. 3133 Signal Company Special. Okay. Now, what kind of stuff do they do? One of the most famous things that they did is if you look at that top picture right there, they created inflatable decoys, you know, tanks and cars and things like that. Stuff that looked pretty real from a distance. But if you get close up to it and you like actually touch it, you're like, wait, this is this is fake. You know, so as you can see, these four guys are lifting. A tank it's a balloon you know they would make um, fake radio calls make it sound authentic make it sound like hey you know this guy's in trouble and hey we need help at this location this location you know um, we need help we're, 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 we're out of gas or you know we're taking enemy fire and you know we need uh, ammunition we need this. so the Nazis would then hear the stuff and think okay well hey these Americans need help, what, or uh, these guys, the Allies need help. Why don't we send troops over there to cut them off and capture them and things like that? In reality, no, these is all fake stuff, you know, it was all fake stuff. Um, and then they would set up loudspeakers, you know, uh, speakers that had like tanks roaming, um, soldiers chit chatting, talking about whatever. So the Nazis would have scouts who would like look and see, oh my God, yeah, there's tanks at this town, or they'd go near a place and, oh yeah, we can hear soldiers just talking about whatever, you know. And when the time, time the Nazis got there, the Ghost Army had already deflated everything and were gone. In between 1944 and 1945, they did about 20 special missions, and. Um, yeah, they were, they were pretty good at their job. The average IQ of the people in this ghost army was about 119, which is not bad. It means they're pretty smart guys. Now, in total, the total number of battles they were in and things like that, how many missions they they set up and 
uh, and uh, achieved. There were only three who died and 30 who were wounded. Out of 1,100 people, three dead you know, and 30 wounded, that's not bad. That is not bad. You know, and they are credited with saving anywhere from 15,000 to 30,000 soldiers in World War II. Now, like I told my classes, the classes, um, the Monday, Tuesday classes, that picture you see at the bottom, that is a setup. That is a picture from the Nazis they took of what they thought was the Allies setting up camp, you know, um, refueling, repairing. When in fact, those are all fake cars, fake tanks, and stuff like that. But by looking at it, you would not guess those are fake. And they are. Alright, really quickly, we'll move this. So Sun Tzu, the author of The Art of War, says, All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable when using our force, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When we are far away, we must make him believe we are near. So my question to you is this. Do you believe that deceptions and lies plays a major role in war? Tell me what you think. If you say yes, explain why. If you say no, explain why. Okay, justify your answer. Um, so go ahead, write your response, pause the video, because we're moving on in three, two, one. All right, so in 1938, German scientists discovered nuclear fission. Fission, not fusion, okay? Now, this is what makes the atomic bomb possible. What nuclear fission is, is when a lighter uh, atom is released and it collides with a bigger atom and once that happens energy is released and free neutrons are allowed to escape and the big um, element becomes lighter elements okay and once it breaks off that's what creates this energy now fission it doesn't sustain all right, if you were to do that and also it'd be like, you know, there'd be a little spark of electricity and things like that, of power. But that's about it. Okay, but this gave the idea of, hey, nuclear atomic power is possible. You know, you got to break down the atom and when it breaks down, uh, energy is released, you know. So the only problem is fusion is needed to sustain that chain of reaction to keep the molecule, molecules to constantly be breaking up instead of just boom that's it you know whereas if fusion happens it can bust off and continue and continue and continue and continue and there you got energy being created constantly you know at a big rate okay Now, one of the big misconceptions that a lot of people have, which really uh, makes me kind of upset, is when people say, Einstein created the bomb, the atomic bomb. Uh, no, he didn't. His equation, E equals MC squared, that's what you saw right there in that picture. Energy and equals mass times speed of light, right? Now, the thing is, the closest Einstein got to creating the bomb was he wrote a letter to President Roosevelt in October 1939 when he heard about the nuclear fission. And he says, you know what, hey, Mr. President, the Nazis are more likely going to be able to create a nuclear weapon with this type of uh, knowledge now. Now, Roosevelt listens to Einstein because, again, he's Einstein. He's the smartest man in the world at that time. And uh, so he listens to him. But he's like, you know, I want to be make sure that it is actually possible. And then Spy Intel comes in saying, hey, we got word that the Nazis are planning to create a big bomb. You know, we don't know what, how they're building it or 
who's the leading it, but that's what their plan is, to make it a big bomb. And that's what Hitler was trying to do, really. So on December 28, 1942, President Roosevelt authorizes the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project is a code name given to the American-led effort to create an atomic bomb. Okay, Now, there was a ton of scientists and uh, government officials who were going to be working on this nuclear research. But the main guy in charge was this guy called J. Robert Oppenheimer. He is considered the father of the atomic bomb. And that's his picture right there. Okay. Here's the thing, though. Yes, there are like 6,000 scientists and engineers from different universities who are good with nuclear fusion, who are good with physics, good with um, creating engineering, things like that. But they did not have these guys all work together. No, 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 no. You're going to find out what they did to make sure that everything is kept hush-hush. All right. So here's your first question, or second question, sorry. If Hitler had created the atomic bomb first, which country do you think he would have dropped the bomb on? So Britain is basically the cockroach that won't die. He's attacked them, he's attacked them, bombed them. They just will not die. They just keep coming. Also, there's Russia. Now, Russia, to Hitler, is like the unstoppable army. No matter what he does, how he attacks them, they just keep coming. He can't win against them. Or do you think he would drop it on the U.S.? Now, the U.S. is basically that, that little thorn on the side of his butt. You know, they were winning the war. They were, you know, took over in Europe. They were taking over in Africa. And then the United States joined in. We kicked them out of Africa. We kicked them out of Italy. And now we're making our way into Europe. So now we're basically his, the new pest. You know, that little thorn on the side. So who do you think he would drop the bomb on? Britain, the cockroach that won't die. Russia, the country that he feels is unbeatable. Or the U.S., who is just the new pain in the butt. Who do you think he would drop it on? And tell me why you think that country would would be the one over the other ones. Okay, justify your reasoning. All right, so... Go ahead, write your response. Well, we're moving on in three, two, one. So, uh, scientists from Britain and Canada actually came to the U.S. to work on this project. Now, again, these guys were like the top guys in physics and things like that, engineering. But they had no idea what all the stuff was, what they were doing, actually. They were just told, you need to make work on this uh, container, you know, make sure it's this big and things like that. You work on um, fusion, see if it's possible. You guys are going to be working on this and that. And they didn't have them, again, in one location. They had them in 30 different locations around the country. All right. Each group is working on different things, and no two groups had contact with one another. They all worked independently, so nobody knew exactly what was happening except for a handful of people. And when I mean a handful, I literally mean a handful of people. Not even the vice president of the United States knew about the atomic bomb. That's how close-knit they made this. Now, of all the locations, there are three major places. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Hanford, Washington, and Los Alamos, New Mexico. Okay. Now... There's a lot of stuff I've heard from students saying they heard this and that, la la la, about the atomic bomb. But one of them always makes me laugh because it's actually true. December 2nd, 1942, the world's first nuclear reactor was started uh, at a squ squash tennis court, you know, in uh, the University of Chicago. They started working on it there. Now, as time went on, they were working on seeing if it'll start, if it'll self-sustain, and that's what happened. It did go critical, and the day that it happened, above these scientist guys, you know, several you know feet above them, there's a football game being played. 
There's people watching a football game above their head. And these people who are watching the game have no idea that they're scientists, you know, underneath them in a little underground lab. And they are just now testing this nuclear reactor. And it's now critical. Now, what I mean by critical, it's this. That nuclear reaction reaches a point at which critical mass starts producing energy. So fusion kind of starts happening. So it's 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 actually starting to create energy, starting to go, you know, and that this is like the first time a nuclear reactor is actually working. Now, if they gave too much energy or pushed it too much, the thing could have easily exploded and boom, there goes everyone at that stadium. You know? So yes, that story of did they build the bomb underneath the football stadium? Yes, that is true. It was the University of Chicago underneath the football field. Yes, they created the bomb there. Part of the bomb. So here's question number three. Do you think the government is still secretly working on things where we live or we work or where we go for entertainment, you know, to the movies, the mall, things like that? Um, if you've seen Stranger Things, um, like that kind of thing, you know, they oh, it's an energy place and, you know, there's like deep underground, there's a, uh, like a facility that they do secret experiments on and things like that. Do you think that goes on? Tell me what you think, All right? Write your response because we're moving on in three, two, one. All right, so now we've come to the part where, like I told you at the very beginning, the slides are gone. They're completely destroyed and missing. So I'm just going to tell you guys what to write down for numbers 19 through 23. <clears throat> All right, so number 19 says, what was the key to causing a chain reaction? That would be plutonium-239. Okay, plutonium-239 was a key thing to get the chain reaction to go. See, Hitler, he had his scientists trying to create the bomb, but these guys were looking at it from the opposite view. You know, I told you that they had an atom, and it hit another atom, and it made some lighter elements. So these guys figured, oh, the key is light elements. When you hit lighter elements, then it would cause an energy. So they look at at the lighter stuff on the periodic chart um, when in fact they should have been looking at the opposite end they should have looked at a heavier elements such as plutonium you know, plutonium is a heavy element compared to like chlorine and helium and hydrogen and things like that you know so that's what uh, helped the uh, chain reaction that was a key thing for the chain reaction. Plutonium-239. All right. Now, number 20 says, what are the what were the two theories of dropping the bomb? All right. I love this question. Okay, so remember, it's right here. See right there, the question? Okay. It's on the back page, so don't forget to write it on there. So what were the two theories on dropping the atomic bomb? Number one was that the chain reaction wouldn't stop. They feared that the chain reaction would just continue and continue and continue to the point where it would engulf the Earth. Okay. Um, I'll give me one second. There we go. So that the um, chain reaction would just go through the whole world. You know, that the it would not die out. It would just continue. Um, so instead of like when you roll a ball down a hill, yeah, you know, it'll catch up speed. And at the very end, when it hits the bottom... It'll just, like, come to a stop, right? Some scientists thought that maybe it's going to be, like, a snowball, you know. And as it goes on, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes down the mountain. And by the time it reaches the uh, flat area, it's just so big, the momentum is just going to keep going and going, you know. So that was a theory. That was one of them. The second one was that the bomb was going to be so big the explosion was going to be so huge and the fire was going to be so hot that when it blew up and it reached into the atmosphere 
that it was going to catch it, the atmosphere on fire, basically blow a hole right through the uh, the magnetic waves that protect our Earth from UV light and solar flares and things like that. It figured it was going to bust, bust a hole through it, and then UV light be coming in from the sun. Um, solar flares might come in and like cook everyone and everything. Uh, so those are the two theories. So with that in mind, now remember, the only people who heard about these theories, excuse me, were the people who actually knew everything, which again was a handful of people. And they decided, let's test the bomb anyway. You know, so that's what they did. So when was it? Uh, if I remember right, it was... Uh, give me one second. I think it was July 16th. Let me double check. Yeah, it was July 16th, 1945. Um, where? At the Trinity site. Um, south of uh, Los Alamos. Okay. And what time? It was at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, 6.30. Either one. You put it down. Um, that's when they tested the um, uh, high, uh, the uh, plutonium bomb. So they had two bombs, basically uranium, which they figured, oh, that's going to explode. But the other one, plutonium, they didn't know if it was going to explode. They didn't know if it was going to be a dud. So they tested it out, and it blew up. <laughs> now, number 22 says, in your own words, what did Oppenheimer say about the bomb? Now, Oppenheimer said that there were some people who, you know, um, cried. There were some people who cheered, you know. There were some people who were just, like, in awe, you know. I, he said that he quoted a, um, uh, I believe it was a Hindu scribe saying, I have become death. The destroyer of worlds. You know, he realized, like, this is destructive. You know, and he is the guy who was in charge of it. Okay. The last one says, how much did the, number 23 says, how much did the bomb cost in modern money? $2.2 $2 billion. Okay, that's how much it costs to make the atomic bombs. In modern day money, two point two billion dollars, billions with a B. All right. So once you have those all written down, you're done with this lesson. Hopefully, you learned something new. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. All right. Again, I do apologize for the tardiness of this video, um, but hey, life happens, you know. So I'll see you guys later. You take care. You be safe. And I'll see you guys in class. Okay.